بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أما بعض يقول إمام أبو عيسى الترمذي رحمة الله عليه باب ما جاء في عيش رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ثم ساق حديث أبي هرارة رضي الله تعالى عنه حيث قال أبو هرارة لقد رأيتني وإني لأجر فيما بين منبر رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وهجرة عائشة مخشيا علي فيجيء الجاء فيد رجله على أنقي يرى أن بي جنونا وما بي جنون وما هو إلا الجوع Come to the chapter, Khwani, chapter number nine. The chapter that is similar to the previous chapters that went before it in regards to the dress of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that is the chapter of how was the Rasul of Islam Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when it came to eating food. How was he when it came to eating food? Was he a person who overindulged and he overate? Or was he an individual who was in the middle? Or was he an individual who didn't eat that much? Or was he an individual who didn't eat at all because he wasn't need, in need of any food? And so forth and so on. And Imam al-Tirmidhi, in bringing this book again, showing the people how the Prophet was, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in his everyday life. And this chapter of eating is similar to the chapter of what he used to wear. He ate the food that his people ate. So there's no such thing as the sunnah is to eat this and to eat that. He encouraged us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if you're fasting, he told us, break your fast on dates. He could have encouraged the people, informed the people, instructed the people to break their fast on other than dates, things that were from the food of his people. But he specifically told them, break your fast on dates. He said, if you don't find the date, then break your fast on water and with water. And issues like that, we say this is the sunnah. This is the sunnah. Because he made it a point to tell all of the people from his ummah. And he knew that he's the messenger and the rasul to all of Beni Adam and to all of the jinn. So when he made the tahdeed and he specified, now that becomes the sunnah. But the fact that he, as our mother Aisha informed us, radiallahu anha, he used to love the shoulder of the meat. There's a person who doesn't like the meat of the shoulder. We won't say to him, you don't like the sunnah. You're against the sunnah. Or an individual, he doesn't like a particular kind of food that the Prophet used to eat. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There were some foods that they used to eat where they would mix ghee with flour, with dates, and with something else. That's not from the food that we like. If someone puts that in front of you, as a dessert, you won't eat it. It's like in the Asian community, when people get married, it is from their culture to give those sweets the different colors, white, the green one, pistachio, and things like that. When they present it to you, uh, we many of us can't eat a whole one of them. We can't put a whole one of those in our mouths. We may break a piece of it off and take it just to make the person happy. So that's, you're just not, that's not your food. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's people, they used to have food. So now you can't tell people that's the Sunnah, you must eat the way the Arabs ate. You must eat with your hands. You don't have to eat like that. Okay, eat with what you are accustomed to. So this issue is a wide open issue. Allah has made everything in the earth halal for Beni Adam. So he can eat what he wants to eat, he can drink what he wants to drink, he can wear what he wants to wear, other than what the text said, don't eat this, don't drink that, don't wear this. And it's small in comparison. <coughs> the first hadith, Abu Hurairah, he said, I used to find myself, he was sitting with the people, and he had two nice thobes on. And they were made out of linen. And the thobes had some lines in them that were red, and they were colorful and nice, showing opulence, showing richness, but not overboard. Abu Hurairah, radiallahu anhu, wanted to sneeze. So he sneezed, and he sneezed inside of his thobe, put in the zukam of his nose inside of the thobe. After doing that, ta'ajjabani nafsihi wali hali. 
He said, wow, look at Abu Huraira. Bakh, bakh, look at Abu Huraira. I remember there was a time, in the beginning of Islam, when I used to be between the member of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the hujra of Aisha, and I would be laying on the ground. And I would be in a condition in which it seemed like I was crazy because of my condition. A person would come over to me and look at me in my condition, and he would put his foot on my neck to keep me stationary, like a person who is needing to be exercised. So you want to keep him stationary and stop him from moving. The person will put his actual foot on the neck of Abu Huraira. He said, the person did that to me because he thought I was crazy. He said, but I wasn't Majnoon. I was just hungry. I was hungry. That was the condition that I was in and the condition that the companions were in. So an imam at Tirmidhi brings this hadith, although it's not from the Prophet Wasallam's action or the Prophet knew about what was going on with Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu, but it shows the condition of the companions, all of them in the beginning of Al-Islam. The Nabi will come out, he will find Abu Bakr and he will find Umar, and he will say, what brought you two out today? They said, we left our homes because we were hungry. And the Prophet will lift up his shirt, whatever he was wearing, he will lift it up, and he would show them that he tied a rock on his stomach, and he said, the same thing brought me out of my house as well. So this goes to show the condition that the Muslims were in at the beginning. As we sit here, none of us can imagine that type of hunger. Recently, in that town in Iraq or in Assyria that was being barricaded, they weren't allowing food to go in, and the people were dying from hunger. I saw some footage of some of the people, like a man 50 years old, who was laying there looking like he was going to die, and he was starving. I mean, he was starving to death, literally, physically starving to death. We saw that on TV, we see that, but we don't know people who are like that. So this is some of the struggles that the companions went through, radhi Allah anhum, and it's from the dalil and the proof of why we love and we honor the companions of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and we don't look at them as just being nice stories that we talk about. They are people who we owe a, great of that, grat a debt of gratitude to. The Prophet's situation, as you're going to see, was more severe than Abu Huraira radhi Allah anhum. So those companions, in the beginning of Islam especially, they went through a lot. Anyone who comes and he says that the companions have apostated or he has something negative to say about those companions, then he has no deen, he has no religion. That's with the companions. Our parents are the same way. Some of our parents, their parents, went through a lot of struggles when they first came here or where they came from. And now that we have this opportunity where you see the kid, you see how he is, the lives of our children are bet, much better than the lives of what our grandfathers were upon. So in respecting and in appreciating and being having shukr to Allah Azza wa Jal, the person shouldn't have al uquq to his mother and his father. He shouldn't have uquq to the companions, disrespecting them, being disobedient against them. That's terrible. Something wrong with you. No deen. Same thing, our mothers and fathers. Those people went through a lot of sacrifice. And that's just the general rule. That our parents, they have not and they did not go through what we are going through in terms of the ease that we have. Transportation. Not only do you have a car, but your mother, your wife has a car. Your son has a car. Parents didn't have any cars. They would walk into school if they went to school. And they would walk five miles going, five miles coming back. Those people who actually went to school. So it's not acceptable. If the person does that against the companions, la deen He doesn't have any deen. Does that to his mother and his father, he has no akhlaq. And as you do it to them, it may happen to you. That's the condition of the Nabi's companion, Radwanullahi alayhi. The next hadith, Ikhwani, and this chapter is a short chapter, but Imam al-Tirmidhi goes further in the Aish of the Nabi later on. But right now, he's bringing on these two hadith, but later on, he's going to bring some more. In the second hadith, it is the hadith in which Malik ibn Dinar, he said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam never became full. He never filled his stomach up with any food, whether it was bread or whether it was meat. He never ate a lot till his stomach became full. The only time when he ate and he became full somewhat is when he had dafaf. 
Malik ibn Dinar asked the narrator of the hadith who was from the people of the Badia, what is the meaning of that word, buffaf? What is that? He said, that is when you eat with other people. So if the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam ate with other people and showing his social skills, he wouldn't eat a little bit and back away from the people and leave them to eat by themselves. He would continue to eat as long as they ate. But keep it in mind, he said that the worst vessel that the son of Adam can fill up Allah Ta'ala has commanded in the Quran, Wakurabbi Zitni Ilma. Oh my Lord, increase me in knowledge. So we should ask Allah for knowledge. We should ask Allah for an addition in many good things of the dunya. But one thing you don't want to go overboard in is filling up the stomach. He said the worst vessel that the son of Adam can fill up is his stomach. And the way we eat, this is just something that's natural. This is how it is. We overeat. Whereas the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, as the hadith is going to tell us later on, his food used to be qut, qut, qaf wa That means he used to eat enough to take off of himself hunger. He didn't overeat. He ate enough just to make the hunger say, "Okay, bye. I'll see you later." He wouldn't just sit there, and after the hunger left, he continued to eat just because it's there, just because it was given to him. And that goes to show when we go and we visit people's homes and they put too much on the plate. You are not responsible. You don't have to eat all of that. Because you didn't tell him to give me a mountain of rice. You never told him that. You eat what's enough for you and then you stop. That's it. He said that Ibn Adam from the Etiquette and the Sun of Eden is that you eat a third of food, you drink a third of water, and then you, need a, you leave another third to be able just to have air because the air is going to help you to be able to digest your food. Al-Imam Al-Tirmidhi, rahmatullahi alayhi, he brought those to a hadith in the ish, or the way his food was, but he's going to go in more detail later on. What kind of foods did he like? What didn't he eat? What kind of foods did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam encourage the people to eat for different reasons? We come to the next issue in the next chapter, and that's the chapter of the shoes of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Some non-Muslims, if they were to sit and they were to visit us, they came to visit the masjid, and they sat in the audience and they said, okay, these people are talking about the actual shoes that their prophet used to wear. The man who they believe is a prophet. Those people would say, with all of what's going on in the world today, that's the most important issue that these people can engage themselves in. The Muslim doesn't look a bit like that. It's not the shoes of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that we're all into. It is the fact that we want to know what he did so that we can be like him to the best of our ability. So you have two extremes. The person who says and he claims he loves the Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he says, "Oh, how I wish I could have just been the shoes of Rasulullah." I don't want to be anybody's shoes. Allah said in the Quran, "Laqad karramna bani Adam." We have honored Bani Adam. Every human being, he has dignity and honor, even the criminals from amongst them. The one who is a criminal and he does pedophile. Pedophile is a big sin and indiscretion, big sin. But still as a human being, he has honor, dignity. Meaning what? Meaning what? I'll give you an example. We know that that leader of the Muslims, Muhammad Qaddafi, he was a criminal. He was a zalim. He was a kafir, non-Muslim, outside of the fold of Islam because of what he used to believe. But when they caught him, after all of what he did, when they caught him, he has honor. He's an asir. He's a captive. He has dignity. You can't punch him in the face. You can't bloody up his nose. You can't do what the people did around him. Now, obviously, the people were upset because emotionally, they remembered all of the things that the man did to their people and so forth and so on. But in Al-Islam, if you were practicing the religion, the religion say, hey, hey, relax. That man has dignity. That doesn't mean you endorse the evil what he did. But as a human being, every Benny Adam, he has dignity. So the Muslim doesn't go to the extreme and say, I wish I could have been the shoes of Hassan or Hussein. I wish I could have been the shoes of Rasulullah. If you're the shoes of Rasulullah, you don't go to Jannah. You want to go to Jannah? 
No, I wish I could have been one of his companions. I wish I could have been one of his children. I wish I could have been his father-in-law. Okay, nothing wrong with that. It's impossible, but it goes to show your iman, what you wish. As for this other stuff, that's ghulu. The other extreme is his shoes don't mean anything. La wallahi. And that's why some of those companions, when the munafiqun and the kufa of Quraysh, the kufa of Medina, when the Prophet came close to them with his horse, with his donkey, they said, get away from us with your donkey, Ya Muhammad. You and your donkey smell and you're bothering us. When the companion heard that, he said, Wallahi, the Prophet's donkey is better than you. His donkey is better than you, smells better than you, look better than you. And the Prophet didn't say anything because that companion was defending the honor of the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the point here, Khwani, is we'll have to be balanced. This chapter is about his shoes. And he wore different kind of shoes, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he wore shoes because he was a human being. If he was from the nur of Allah, flying around, you can't grab the nur of Allah. He was in no need of shoes and food and clothes. So concerning the issue of the shoes, a number of hadith. Anas ibn Malik, who used to take care of his shoes, used to bring to him his shoes, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Put on his shoes, take off of his shoes. Anas ibn Malik. He said that the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, he used to wear shoes that had two laces in them. Two laces. One side over here, one side over there. Two laces for what? To tie them up. To tie them up. Innama ana basharu mithlukum. Qul, innama ana basharu mithlukum. I have shoes like everybody else. I don't put my feet in my shoes, and then they tie themselves up. I don't put my feet in my shoes, and they don't have any shoe strings. They don't have anything to keep them on my feet. I don't put my feet in my shoes, and then they transport me from El Medina to Mecca and back again. No, regular shoes. So his shoes had these particular shoes. They had two laces. In the next hadith, Abdullah bin Abbas, he said that the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, he had some shoes that had double, they had double straps. Two straps on this side, two straps on that side. So one had two laces, two. Just one here, one there. And he had some shoes that he wore, had two, two. He would tie them up like that. So like everybody else, is an indication that what? Rasulullah's clothes, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they used to fade away like everybody else's clothes. But although his clothes fade away from the khasais of the NBN, and the Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is that he says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, inna al-arda la ta'kulu ajsad al-anbiya. The earth doesn't eat the bodies of the prophets or the messengers. So their clothes get ripped and fade away. But their bodies do not fade away. Salawatu Allahi wa salamu alayhim ajma'in. Hadith number three, Akhwani, and some of these hadith are repetitive. And that is the hadith of Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu. He said, I saw that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he had a pair of shoes that were a septiya. They were the shoes that were a septiya. He said, the Nabi used to wear those shoes, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and they didn't have any hair on them, any fur on them. He used to wear those shoes when he made wudu. And I, as a result of that, love to wear this type of shoe. So the shoe that is septiya is already mentioned in the hadith. It's the shoe that comes from the cow's hide, from the leather of the cow. And there's a way that you can manufacture any shoe with any material, and the fur may stay on or the fur may come off. The shoe that is septia, the fur comes off, but there was fur on the shoe. But the way you make the shoe, the fur comes off. So Abdullah bin Umar said, because Rasulullah wore this kind of shoe, I like that kind of shoe. So if a person wants to do something that he did, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he'll get the reward. And Abdullah bin Umar, from amongst the companions, as we mentioned a number of times, from his special qualities that we should know about him, he was one of the young companions. He was from the Abadala, Al-Abadala, the four Abdullahs that narrated the majority of the hadith. Abdullah ibn Amr, ibn al-As, Abdullah ibn Abbas, Abdullah ibn Zubair and Abdullah ibn Umar. As for Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, 
although he narrated a lot of hadith, that he didn't have the hadith of the abadala, and he's not from those four. Again, who are the abadala? Like the Shaykhain, like Shaykh of Islam, Shaykh of Islam. These are phrases that we hear in the circles of knowledge, in the books of knowledge, so that we'll know what is it talking about? The hadith of Jibril and so forth and so on. The abadala, Abdullah ibn Umar. Abdullah ibn Amr, ibn al-Az, Abdullah ibn Zubair, and Abdullah ibn, ibn Umar, ibn Amr ibn al-Az, ibn al-Zubair, and ibn Umar, and ibn Umar. So he did that in following Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Hadith number 79 from the chapter is what has already been mentioned. That his shoes used to have one lace on each side, two laces, one on each side. Hadith number 80. Hadith number 80 is that the companion of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam, Sufyan said about Suddi, he said that he heard from Amr ibn Huraif, may Allah be pleased with him, he said that I saw the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he prayed in his shoes that had leather sewn onto the soles. I saw him pray and he had some shoes on in which leather was sewn onto the sole. So the shoe was like that, but it had some additional leather sewn onto the sole. The companions came and they said, Ya Um al Mu'minin Aisha, Mother can yes not and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fi bayti. What did he used to do in his house? He said, she said. He used to do what you do in your own houses. He used to fix his own shoes and he used to fix his own fold. Now can the wife say to the husband, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to fix his own fold, so therefore I'm not ironing your fold. The sunnah is you must iron your fold. She can't say that. She can encourage him and say, hey, don't treat me like an amma. Don't treat me like an asira." Rasulullah is better than you and he used to take care of his own clothes and he used to help his family in the house. But the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam told us, I'm telling you people to be good to these women that you're married to. You took charge of them by the aman of Allah. Allah gave you an amana and they are like your captives. They are like your captives. He said, Al Mar'a, wal Mar'a tu mas'ula tu. Wa hiya mas'ula and bayti zawjiha wa waladihi. The woman is responsible for the man's house and she's responsible for his children. So she should be doing, and help, doing the things in the house, domesticated things. But if they have an agreement, no problem. But that's the asal. Anyway, Rasulullah used to pray in his shoes. If he prayed out in the desert, outside in his shoes if he prayed in a masjid that didn't have any carpet it's dirt in his shoes and he used to tell the people khaliful yahud sallu fi ni'alikum fannuhum la yusalluna fi ni'alihim be different from the jews pray in your shoes they don't pray in their shoes so be different from them but this issue requires fiqh even if we're outside and with a bunch of people performing hajj we're with a bunch of people who they don't know much about Islam and they don't know much about the Sunnah. We're not going to wear our shoes if the people are going to say, oh, what are you doing? What are you doing? We're not going to make that fitna for the people. If there are people who listen to you, people make an iqtida. They respect you. So when you do something, they're going to say, this guy is doing something from the Sunnah. It's not a problem. But if you're going to, to sabbat mashakil with the farruq, all it, don't do it. Because it's wajib to keep the peace, to keep things calm. It's the sunnah to pray in your shoes. So you don't do the sunnah at the expense of the wajib. You don't come into the masjid and the imam is praying salatul fajr, two rakat, and you go over there in the corner to pray the two rakat of the sunnah fajr because rakat al fajr khayru min al dunya ma fiha. So you go, la, you can't miss the rakat, you can't miss the qira'a, you can't miss the salat, in order to do the sunnah. Same issue with these shoes. Don't come into this masjid or any masjid where they have a carpet. Now when you come into the masjid, you're going to dirty the carpet. You come into the masjid, 
you're going to bring inside of the masjid something from the qadarat that you brought outside from the, that's on your shoes, so forth and so on. So it's an issue that requires fiqh. fiqh. The hadith before that said that the Nabi made wudu in his shoes, that Abdullah ibn Umar said they were the septia. The hadith can mean he made wudu and he kept his shoes on and wiped over his shoes. Because it said, Tawadda'a fi na'alayhi. He made wudu and his shoes were on. And that's thabit. That he used to make wudu and wipe over his shoes. al bura ibn Azib, he said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam He used to wipe over the tasakhin from the word sukhin. At tasakhin, the scholar said, is anything that you wear that covers your feet and protects your feet. It can be socks, it can be leather hoofs, it can be your shoe, it can be a boot. So that general hadith, in the word and the language of the Arab, anything that covers your foot, the Prophet used to wipe over it, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. So again, his shoe, he fixed it up, and he put leather, he put some leather on the soles to solve the problem, to solve the problem that he was dealing with in his shoe, or with his shoe, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. The next hadith, ikhwan, is the hadith of Abu Huraira. He said that our Nabi and our Rasul al-Mustafa al-Sadiq al-Mustuq, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, aqal, la yamshiyanna ahadukum fi na'lim wahidatin. No one should wear only one shoe. He said, either wear both of your shoes, or take both of your shoes off. So look at our religion. Wallahi, from your feet to your head. Our religion has dealt with everything. Alhamdulillah. Like it, who like it, hate it, who hate it. From your foot all the way to your head. Someone say to you, okay, Akhi, tell me something about Islam that says about the foot. He's going to say, you can wipe over your foot. You wash your foot in wudu. This one's going to say something about the foot. Many things have been mentioned. About every step that you take to the masjid. Okay. Next one say, okay. Tell me something about your ankle bone. The guy is going to say, you have to. The prophet said, The man may will do, but he didn't clean all of his, he didn't get water all on his ankle bone. So he was telling them, hey, get all of your ankle bone. Get all of your ankle. Get water on them. Because your ankle bone will be in a hellfire if you don't make proper wudu. The other one's going to say, you can't wear your clothes below your ankle bone. Next guy's going to say, tell me about the sock, this thing right here, between your ankle bone and your knee. That guy's going to say, all of that distance from my knee to my ankle bone, my thobe can be anywhere in that. So we covered that and everything. He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, at talaq liman akhada bisaq. The one who has the ability to divorce between the men and the women is the one who took control of the sock. And that is a figurative way of speaking, saying only the man can divorce by saying you're divorced because he took control of the lady's sock. And that's what the Arabs used to say to show you're in control of something. You have control of your enemy's sock. Somebody says, what happened to your enemy? You say, hey, we took control of their we took control of their socks, man. We we got them by the sock. That's it. You know, you have power over them. It, it comes to the knee. He said, What does the religion say about the knee? He said, Well, for a man, that's where his aura stops outside of salat. What about his thigh? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said about the thigh that the thigh of a man is going to talk to him Yom al before Yom al his thigh is gonna tell him what his father, his family is doing in his house. All the way up, everything from the bottom of his feet to the top of his head, our religion says something. So in this particular hadith, Ikhwani, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam, as Abu Hurairah said, he said, don't anybody walk with one shoe on. Put both of those shoes on or take both of those shoes off. Scholars gave many ta'lilat, sabab, asbab, hikam. They gave a lot of reasons why. The two that seems to be the most plausible is that the Prophet Sallallahu prohibited us from wearing one shoe on and one shoe off is because there is a ziyada on this hadith. Al-Imam al-Tirmidhi didn't bring the ziyada, but there's a hadith that says 
None of you should walk in one shoe. Either put both shoes on or go barefooted. فَإِنَّ الشَّيْطَانِ يَمْشِي فِي النَّعْلَ الْوَاحِدَ Because shaitan, he wears one shoe. He eats with his left hand. He drinks with his left hand. He gives with his left. He takes with his left. And he also walks with one shoe. So the Muslim has been commanded, don't be like the shaitan. Don't be from the brothers of shaitan. Don't be from his party. The people waste, they're the brothers of shaitan. Any hadith, any ayah that says, you're the brother of shaitan, you're the wali of shaitan, shaitan followed you, you're following shaitan. Whatever that thing has been described, it's a major sin, you shouldn't be doing it. So that's one reason. Because shaitan, from his characteristics, you know, our religion said everything. I can go around this room. I can say, Akhi, tell me something about shaitan. He says, shaitan, all he, has, all he can do is make wiswas. That's all. He can't grab you by your head and make you drink khamr. Can't make you. That one said, what's shaitan? He said, what kind of kaydu shaitan is da'ifa? Shaitan is weak. He's really weak. Can't do nothing to you. That one, what's shaitan? He's created from smokeless fire. Hey, what's shaitan? He was on the scene during that time when Adam was there with uh, the malaik and so forth. What about shaitan? Shaitan, he doesn't like the dhikr of Allah. And that, what about shaitan? Shaitan, he passes gas. Shaitan passes gas. So he's khabif. And there are many characteristics. As you sit there, I'm not telling you anything new. The average regular Muslim, he knows more about his religion, although he's not a scholar, he knows more about his religion than what some of the so-called scholars know in the religion of the other people. Because just being a regular Muslim, you just are going to learn a lot about your religion. Just got to do more. We all got to make more jihad. Second reason, Ikhwani, that the scholars said that the Nabi prohibited us from walking in one shoe is the fact that from the justice of Al-Islam, the great scholar, Sheikh Al-Islam, Thani ibn Qayyim, he, he, he wrote a book in his book, is called Tuhfud al Mawdood Bi Ahkam al Mawlood. This book is the gift to someone to someone that I love. And the book is talking about the Ahkam of the children. So the Sheikh wrote, How do you name your child? Doing the Aqiqa, what you have to do for your kid, what the Quran and the Sunnah said about your kid. From his feet to his head, the religion said everything. From his body is his member, his private part, Akramakumullah. The Prophet said about that private part, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Man yadman li ma bayna lihyayhi wa ma bayna rijlayhi, adman lahu al jannah. If any of you guarantee me you'll take care of what's between your jawbone, your tongue, and you take care of what's between your legs, your private part, your member. He said, I guarantee you, you'll go to Jannah. Okay, our religion dealt with that issue. You have to take the hair off of that place. And the things that come out of that place, Barakallah Fikum, this is the hukum for many, that's the hukum for medhi, that's the hukum for whatever. And if many comes out, and a child comes out of that many, that child, our religion told us everything we need to know about. How to welcome that child into the dunya. Everything. So, Ibn al-Qayyim, he wanted to talk about, in his book, the ahkam of the children, the impermissibility of cutting the child's hair the wrong way. From your feet to your head. There's a certain haircut you can't get. You can't get that haircut. Some is there, some is low. Some is here, some is low. You have to cut your hair a particular way. So he talked about the impermissibility. The prophet saw a young boy. The young boy, he had his hair cut low around here, and up here was more. He said, don't do that. Don't give your child the, the, the qaza. He said, either cut it all evenly, or let it grow evenly. So Ibn al-Qayyim in that book, he said, Shaykh al-Islam, our teacher, said about the wisdom of this, and he started talking about, the justice of Al-Islam. That the religion of Al-Islam, Ibn Taymiyyah said, and he put that in his book, Ibn Qayyim put the kalam of the Shaykh in the book, that Allah Ta'ala has ordered us to be just to our bodies. 
We've been ordered to be just with the kuffar. We've been ordered to be just with every situation. Allah said in the Quran, Ayat, Ayat, in Allah, Yuhibbul Muqsiteen. Allah loves those who are just. They're fair and they're just. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu kunu qawwameena lillahi kunu qawwameena bil qis kunu qawma qawwa qawwameena bil qis shuhada lillah Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu kunu qawwameena bil qis shuhada lillah walau ala anfusikum awal walidaini wal aqrabi Stand up as witnesses for the truth for Allah against yourselves against your mother and your father against your relatives Ayat وَلَا يَجْرِمَنَّكُمْ شَنَآنُ قَوْمٍ عَلَىٰ أَنْ لَا تَعْدِلُوا اِعْدِلُوا هُوَ أَقْرَبُ لِلْتَّقْوَىٰ Don't let people who oppress you make you become oppressive. Be fair and just. Justice is closer to a taqwa. You do the right thing. إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَأْمُرُكُمْ إِذَا إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَأْمُرُكُمْ أَنْ تُؤَدُّوا الْأَمَانَاتِ إِلَىٰ أَهْلِهَا وَإِذَا حَكَمْتُمْ بَيْنَ النَّاس Anyone who has an amana, give it back to the people. And if you have to judge between the people, judge with justice. And judging, it doesn't mean only you're the judge who the people come to you in your office and you say, judge. Someone says to you about this person or that person. You have to give a judgment. Is what they're saying true or not? Allah said, be fair and just. And from the fairness and the justice is that we have to say things like we've been saying Wearing the thobe halfway to your sock is from the sunnah. Don't hate that because you may not like people who do that. And some of the masajid that we don't agree with, like the people of At-Tasawwuf, some of them memorize the Quran and they put a lot of work in memorizing the Quran and they send their children to the madrasa. We're not going to say because they're people of At-Tasawwuf, no, that's not good. We're going to say, no, that's right what they're doing. And they're better than us. Than us. In their masjid, their women dress like this. And when it's time for salat, they come together and they take their time. They come, and we don't do that. Even if it's not for you. It's just the justice of al-Islam. It's the justice. He says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sab'atun yadhilluhum allahu fi dhillihi yawm la dhilla illa dhilluhum. Seven people will be under the shade of Allah on the day that there will be no shade, except his shade. The very first person from those seven he mentioned, imamun adil. The imam who's fair and just from the virtues of justice. He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in the Muqsitin, ala manabir, min nur, ala yameen al Rahman, wa kilta yadehi, yameen, aladina yadiluna fi hukmihim wa ahlihim wa ma walu. Those people were fair and just. They would be on mimbars, pulpits made out of light on the right side of Ar Rahman. And both of his hands are right hands. Who are those people who are the fair and just ones? Those people when they give rulings, they're fair and just. Those people when they deal with their families, they're fair and just. He has multiple sons. Multiple. Six sons, one daughter. Even the one who is the most beloved one to him, he's fair with her and everybody else between his kids. He's fair between his wives. He's fair between his mother and his father. He's fair between his sisters and his brothers. He's fair and he's just. They're the ones who when they give a hukum, a judgment, they're fair. When they have their family members, they're fair. And if Allah puts them and makes them responsible for something, they're fair. And this is why we say, don't come and ask us to make dua on Friday for your uncle who died in your country. Don't come and ask us to make salatul janazah, al-ghaib, for your uncle who died in your country because you're responsible for this so now I'm going to do it for you and I won't do it for him and then I do it for him and I won't do it for him and I do it for him and I won't do it for him nah it's not fair you're in a position you have the zakat you have the zakat of the community if this guy comes his brother comes he wants help you say no can't give you help you know I mean I'm going to give you help the other guy comes he wants help because it's come from your background, your tribe, your relatives, your, you say, okay, we're going to give you the help. No, you can't be like that. If you're fair and just, if people are fair and just, they'll get the just due and the just reward from Allah Azza So that's more than half of the chapter. If you brothers have any questions, inshallah, concerning this chapter, you can put your questions forward.
I got a feeling that we jumped over a chapter. No, 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 we didn't jump over the chapter. I have a feeling, I thought there was something before. Huh? No, no, we, we, we did the right thing. But I think there was a hadith that Nah, nah, in that hadith, I didn't read that part. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, Ikhwani. The hoofs. We jumped over the hoofs, huh? We jumped over it. All right. We have to do this hoofs real quickly, inshallah. Hadith number 72. This chapter was between the two that we did. We jumped over it. Nah, the hoofs. The hoof, Ikhwani, is the leather sock that people wear on their feet. That's the hoof. So this chapter is the khuf of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And the companion of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wasallam, Burayda, he said that the Najashi, the Najashi, radi Allah anhu, he gave as a gift to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam two black khufs. The Prophet alayhi wasallam used to put them on and then he would wipe over them or upon them. So the Najashi was a Muslim and we don't say he was a companion because he never met the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam but he believed in Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam this word Najashi is not his name the Najashi is a title that the Ethiopians, the Abyssinians used to give to their leader this particular Najashi had a name. It's a difficult name to pronounce. After him, another one had a name. But a Najashi is not his name. But he became known as the Najashi. That's not his name, though. But again, that's why I'm telling you some of these, um, some of these, some of these words, some of these uh, things, Sheikh al-Islam, al-Sheikhan, Muttafiqun Ali, these things like that. We have to know it because you know what's being spoken about. So when it is said, and Najashi, the mind of the Muslim goes to that one who was a Muslim. Rahmatullahi alayhi. So he gave the Prophet وسلم, a gift and a Prophet wore it. Uh, gave him a gift of khufs. So a person can utilize a gift that is taken from him. And there's a lot of virtues in giving gifts. Tahadu, tahabu give gifts and increase and foster the love between you even if the gift is his perfume even if the gift is something small exchange gifts between yourselves this is sunnah that we should implement the last hadith in this particular chapter is hadith number 73 from the book but we pass some other hadith in it is that al-mughira ibn shu'bah may Allah be pleased with him he said that the prophet was given sallallahu alayhi wasallam some khufs by his companion dihya Dihya. He gave him two khufs. Rasulullah put him on. Sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So Israel said that Jabir, that Jabir said that Amr said that the Prophet was given a jubba, a cloak, a coat. He put that on as well. And he didn't know, and he didn't ask as well, he didn't know the cloak that was given, the khufs that were given. Was it slaughtered this way or that way? He didn't ask that question. He didn't know. So the hadith goes to show, again, someone gives you a gift, you can use it. Dihya ibn Khalifa al-Kalbi. He gave the Prophet this gift, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Dihya was the companion who was extremely handsome. Jibril used to come in the form of a man. And he would take on the image of Dihya. Because Dihya was handsome and the malaika are handsome. The malaika are not ugly. And the kuffar of Egypt used to know that. So when the women saw Yusuf and he came out, they said, Hasha lillah. Hadha laysa bi bashar. It's not a human being. This is an angel. Because they had knowledge from what we believe about the malaika. They have wings. Two, three, four. The malaika of Allah Azza wa Jalla created from a nur they don't disobey Allah they do this they do that they fly around they do many functions they preceded Bani Adam and from them they are handsome they're not ugly Malaika are not ugly 
Dekhi ibn Khalifa al-Kalbi gave the Nabi, the Prophet didn't know. These shoes that I've been given, the leather, were they slaughtered this way or that way? Because when you kill the animal and you dye the animal, it purifies it. And also, if you, if you dye his, uh, his um, skin, it purifies it. A dibah will purify the skin of an animal. So if you got an animal, it was cut, something from it was cut, you took that, you put that, um, dye on it, you purified it. Prophet didn't ask the question. He didn't know. So that's a proof he doesn't know. the But even more important, or just as important as that, it shows a principle in our religion, and that principle is don't go around making things difficult on yourself that Allah Ta'ala didn't uh, make you responsible for. Don't be of those people. Go around asking unnecessary questions. He won't pray in this masjid until he finds out where did they purchase this carpet from. Was it from a Jewish factory or from a Christian factory or Muslim factory? So his religion is, I boycott all Jewish products. Where did you guys get this microphone from? I won't come to Juma until I know. How are you going to live your life like that? How are you going to live your life like that? He won't buy a car. He won't. And there are people who are like that. How The prophet wasn't like that. Because that's too much. That's ghulu. He told the people, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, إِذَا دَخَلَ أَحَدُكُمْ عَلَىٰ أَخِيهِ الْمُسْلِمِ فَأَطْعَمَهُ مِنْ طَعَامِهِ فَلْيَأْكُلْ وَلَا يَسْأَلْ عَنْهُ وَإِذَا سَقَاهُ مِنْ شَرَابِهِ فَلْيَشْرَبْ وَلَا يَسْأَلْ عَنْهُ If any of you goes to your brother's house and he gives you some food, eat it and don't ask him where it came from. If he gives you some water, something to drink, Kool-Aid, juice, whatever, drink it and don't ask him where did it come from. Don't do that. And there's some people are like that. Wait, 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 where'd you get that chicken from? Was it halal or haram? It's halal, man. What are you talking about? Yeah, but which butcher? Because those butchers on that side of Coventry Road are a problem. The ones on that side. Just eat that meat. It's not your job. Where did your wife cook that rice in? Did she cook it in the pot that was brought from the Yahud or the pot that was brought from the, the store over here on Green Lane Court over here, A G A A N G right there? And it goes on like that. And his life is difficult. You only ask if you have a legitimate reason to ask. There's something that causes you to have some doubt. You were at your mother-in-law's house. You saw something in your mother-in-law's house. There was something that had khamr in it. Something like that. And now it's in your house. Your wife brought something to your house. You saw it. Now you have a reason to ask. Well, where did that come from? Where did this come from? And now you have the reason. But... We shouldn't go around asking things. Don't ask about things. If they were to make known to you, life would be difficult. Don't ask. Life would be difficult. The man has two wives. She says, who do you love the most? Me or her? Don't ask those kind of questions. Because even if he is politically correct and he says, don't ask me that. There's trouble already. Because she's going to make ta'wil of that kalam. You didn't answer, and I know what the answer is. So, so he has to say, and he has to make kedip. And he has to say, I love you the most, of course. Hands down. There's no comparison. She says, you're lying. <laughs> so don't ask about things. It's not your business, Ikhwani. It's not your business. And if you were to know the truth, it would make it difficult. It would be difficult. Okay, this, this microphone, we, we got this from the cheap price. Off of eBay, we got it from a company, and the guy is Miles Feinstein. We got it from him. He said, okay, I'm not going to mix a lot in your message, Juma in your message, your message, man. Where are you going to make Juma at? Him and people who think like him, they're going to make Juma outside, on the roof, on the roof of Birmingham, on the roof. Okay, Akhwani, because we left out that chapter, we won't take any questions. Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabiyina wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'een.